There are more verses to that song. I love that song. <clears throat> well, if you uh, haven't noticed, we here at Main Street are looking to appoint elders and deacons, and we're thinking about this, and hopefully we're all, we've all been studying our Bibles, hopefully we've all been praying about this, but what I want us to all be aware of is maybe the broader picture, because you may be sitting here wondering, where do I fit in in the body of Christ? Where do I fit in? Fit in? And luckily, I'm very happy to announce that everyone has a place in the body of Christ. Everyone has a function. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a role. And so when we think about how we should organize ourselves, we need to remember the point of it, right? Because we, it's easy to get distracted and kind of getting into, I know, I, me personally, you know, I've been diving into the Greek, like in 1 Timothy 3 and everything else. But yes, that's important, but not to the exclusion of the overriding charge and the overall picture that God has painted us through his words about how the body of Christ should operate. Now, who here has seen a chart like this? Yeah, yeah, lots of folks have seen a chart like this. I, I grew up on these charts, and I've come to not like these charts very much. They may not be inherently untrue, but I get this picture instead from scripture, that there's one head, and what what is the head? That means it's the ruler, right? The ruler, the king, right? All dominion to the lamb, as we just sang. And then there's the head and there's the body. <laughs> to me, that's a, that's a lot simpler. There's the head, the head is Christ, and then we're all members of the body of Christ, no matter what our role is. And when we think about Christ's kingdom, Christ's kingdom is what we call an upside down kingdom, isn't it? Right? Yeah, I mean, we think about bless the one who persecutes us, pray those who, who abuse us, forgive our enemies, love our enemies. You know, all these things are upside down logic that doesn't make sense in the material world. That's because we're call, called to live life in the spirit because God has made us alive in the spirit. And so it shouldn't surprise us when it comes to biblical leadership in the body of Christ, it's going to be upside down. <laughs> the leadership is going to be a different kind of leadership than the kind that we see in the world because I don't, we've all, have you all ever had an oppressive boss who is just borderline a tyrant? I'm not talking, not, not here. I'm not, I'm not raising my hand for the bosses here. If I get my sales job, I just had, I've had terrible bosses before. It's not so in the body of Christ. Look at Mark 9, verse 35. It says, and he sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, if you want to be first, if you want to be a head, if you want to be a leadership, he must be last of all and servant of all. That those who take a leadership position in the church are the servants, <laughs> the ones who put themselves last to the benefit of the body. When we talk about the upside-down kingdom, it's going to be an upside-down kind of leadership. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles? So if you take away from the greater text of 1 Corinthians 12, we, we'll look a little bit more at that later, we, we can take away that we as the body of Christ have different functions and different purposes and different roles. There's no such thing as a role making you some sort of super Christian, right? Just because you're an elder or a deacon or a preacher, that doesn't make you more saved right, than just a, a member, just a saint. That's equal in God's eyes because you're part of the body of Christ. There's the head and there's the body. A brand new babe in Christ is no more or less a member of Christ's body than an elder. Bottom line, there's a place and a work for every single member in the body of Christ. But we have to ask, is there any specific structure within the body of Christ? And thankfully, Paul wrote a letter to Timothy and gave him a list of qualifications for some of these specific roles. 1 Timothy 3.14, after giving these qualifications, this is the point that Paul wants Timothy to gather around. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that, he's like, this is why I'm talking about all these qualifications. I'm writing them why. So if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Within your family, do you have expectations of behavior and roles that people, you know, like with chores, I'm, when I was a kid, we had delegated chores, right? My parents said I had the trash and other brothers had laundry, other brothers had dishes, and we would just kind of rotate with those chores, but we all had an expectation and we all had a function within that family. And household of God indicates it is a family of God, right? This is God's house and God doesn't have favorite children, 
<laughs> it's that simple. He doesn't favor one child over another. We all have this equality within Christ, that there's no slave, no Greek, no Jew. It's all one under Christ. But what about titles and offices? Because we see that all throughout the New Testament writings. We see different titles uh, being mentioned. And this is where we need to make a distinction, because this is an important thing. Like, we have it in our minds that there's kind of this office of elder or, de- or like deacon, and those are those things. But what we have to understand is those titles are descriptions of the dedicated work that these folks got involved with. So there's a difference between using it as a description of the kind of work that an individual is doing and the office that an individual is doing. And here's what I'll explain. If that sounded like Greek to you, here's an example. Who were the apostles? We think of those that Jesus handpicked, right? First they had 12, then Judas, then you know he, he went kaput, then there's Matthias, and then Saul, and those who, who are who we think about as the apostles. And I would argue that's correct. <laughs> that's 100% correct. But look at this account of Paul and Barnabas in Lystra. In Acts 14.14, 14, it says, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Was Barnabas an apostle? That's kind of confusing. No. Look, look, at, look back at Acts 9.27. It says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. That was Saul. So see, here is a distinction between Barnabas and their, the apostles. There's a separation there. So what does apostle mean? That's why we have to figure out what the word means. Apostle or apostolos is just a messenger. I don't know why I said that in a Spanish accent, not a Greek one. I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, it means a messenger or one sent on an appointed task. That's all it means. But there's a difference between using apostle to refer to Jesus' hand-picked disciples to go on this mission and just a generic apostle, one sent. And why would it call Barnabas an apostle? Well, go back to the beginning of Saul and Barnabas' evangelistic journey. Look at Acts 13 too. Remember, that was Acts 14 that we just read where it calls Saul, uh, Barnabas an apostle. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The Holy Spirit had specifically ordained Paul and Barnabas to be sent out to this mission. So in this context, Barnabas was one sent or an apostle. But the scripture nowhere indicates that he was considered one of the apostles. We can go all throughout the book of Acts where it makes a distinction between there's Barnabas and then the apostles, or Barnabas spoke to the apostles. And so, obviously, he's not one of the hand-picked men, but he was one sent. And this is the same for the word deacon. You know what deacon means? Servant. (laughs) That's all it means, servant. In the New Testament scriptures, we see men, women, angels, all involved in deaconing. So, you know, we say, oh, oh no, what does that mean? Let's all freak out. It's like, no, it's a word. It's a description of what they did. And it shouldn't surprise us that we see all these folks deaconing or serving because Jesus tells his followers that they are supposed to serve one another. Luke 22, 25, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. And Jesus even gave the example of washing the apostles' feet, right? And he says, you do to each other. We're all supposed to be servants, every single one of us. But there's a difference between serving or deaconing and serving as and in the office of a deacon. And so this is what we're only going to kind of camp out right here in Philippians 1.1. Because to me, this is the most concise example of the roles in the church that we see. Philippians 1.1, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants. You know what that word is there? They're the servants? Deacons. But then what's at the end there? Deacons. So <laughs> obviously, they're not saying we're deacons. He's making a distinction, right? That there's an office of deacon, and then all of us are supposed to be servants. So Paul and Timothy... Servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. So what was Paul? <laughs> he was an apostle. <laughs> Look at almost in every intro that he ever wrote. It's Paul, an apostle or bond servant, and then Acts confirms this as well. First Corinthians, he describes that he was like one born out of undue time or out of season. So Paul was an apostle, and that just means one sent. But specifically with Paul in the context, 
It's one of the select men handpicked by Jesus for a mission, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was the one chosen by Jesus. Now, what was Timothy? Because we saw Paul, Timothy. Well, Timothy was an evangelist. We can see that in 2 Timothy 4 or 5, where Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. That means there's a role, there's a work to do as an evangelist. And that means a proclaimer of the gospel or of good news. So it's a description word to describe a teacher, a preacher, instructor, someone who engaged in that work. But specifically, it is a Christian that works in the field of teaching, instructing, studying, and preaching, and proclaiming the Gospels and the Scripture. Look at 2 Timothy 4 in verse 1. It says, I charge you in the present, and who is he speaking to? Timothy the evangelist. I charge you, this is your mission, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Right? That's proclaim it. <laughs> proclaim the word. Instruct. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That's the work of an evangelist. I think that's a great summary right there. Note that the work of the apostles and evangelists are not confined to a localized body. Right? I mean, that's why preachers, you see them, they preach at one congregation, and then they, you know, they'll move on, they'll preach to another congregation. That's because their work isn't necessarily localized. You don't have to be at a specific congregation and being compensated to do the work there. A preacher is just someone who does the work, no matter where they are. And same with the Apostle Paul, right? He worked with congregations, but he didn't confine himself to a localized body. Why? Because an evangelist is not an authority position. Uh, an evangelist is just a member. <laughs> that's, that's why there's the localized, there's a lot of rules for the local leaders, whereas the evangelist is kind of more transient because they're not going to do the leading of the flock there, just the instructing, the teaching. And then we saw saints in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. And saints means holy ones, or the state of being holy or set apart. So it's descriptive. It's a generic term used of anyone that is in the universal body of Christ. That's everyone. Everyone who, has, who is a disciple of Christ is a saint. But specifically, well, we, we don't know exactly because it depends on what you are. It depends on your station in life. So look at Titus 2.2. 2. What's the role of a saint? Well, there's different instructions. Like older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, these are all saints right here, right? But then they all have different, within the saint role, they have different purposes and different missions. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. You see, there's this teaching and this guidance, and I was, thought it was kind of funny that he says to teach young women to love their husbands, because I guess he knew how intolerable we could be sometimes. <laughs> so he's like, hey, you know, teach the women how to get along with them. And then we also see elders, and that means one who looks, literally, means one who looks intently after, like oversight, this overseer, someone who's watching, guiding, and is used about shepherd. So it's descriptively as a shepherd, a leader, and an overseer. But specifically, it is a group of selected men and a local body chosen to bear the responsibility of a shepherd, those that meet the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1 as well. And here's an example of this being used in Scripture. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. So A, Peter was an apostle, but he was also a elder, or also an overseer. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker and the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. See, this is a localized work in contrast to Timothy and, and the Apostle Paul. He says, this is a localized work. Elders, you stay there, right? You're for this congregation. Gist can't wander over down to Texas and go to, I don't know, a Beaumont Church of Christ and then just say, oh, I'm elder here now. I'm going to start doing the work of an elder. Because you know what? It really depends. You can't be a good shepherd if you don't know the people, <laughs> if you don't know the flock, right? I, I, can, I can't picture if Dutch and Gist went over to like somewhere, some church in L.A. and California, right? Would, would you have an easy time being a shepherd to those folks? Probably not. There's a huge culture barrier, right? So just because someone you know, would be a good elder at one place doesn't mean they'd be a good elder at another place because it's all dependent upon the local community and the local body of believers and what that needs. Because, I mean, there's awesome elders that wouldn't be a great elder at this location and you know, vice versa. 
He says, exercising oversight. That's that watching, that looking after, that tending to. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. That these overseers, not only are they supposed to be giving this oversight and to be feeding the sheep, looking out for wolves, you know, all those things, they're also supposed to serve as examples. Meaning these are the people that you want to be talking to your kids and say, hey, you know, look at them. They're living this way. Look at what their lives have produced. Look at the blessings that they've had from following closely the word of God and from being such a close disciple of Jesus. That's the standard. It's someone that you want to, your kids to be like. I think that's the best way I can describe it. You look at him, I want my kids to be like that. That's the example that you want in an overseer. And this is why it's so important. And I don't know everyone's background or everyone's experiences, but I have personally seen the damage of what a, a bad eldership can do. I've seen it when folks who are very egotistical, folks who have abused the sheep, who have domineered the sheep and ruled them and caused some to leave the faith, I've seen it. All right, so this, this isn't a trivial matter when we're talking about God's standard for servants and for the roles. We can't take this lightly, right? This is something that we all seriously need to be praying about because ultimately this is Christ's church. It's not Gis, it's not Dutch, it's not mine, it's not Faye's, it's not Doug's. This is Christ's church. And so we need, need to be sincerely praying, God, your will be done in this. If it's not good, shut it down. <laughs> and if it's great, keep it going. And just ask God to do that. I remember that changed my life when my mentor told me to do that. Because I was, I was preaching on a circuit at, at the time. I was working. I was stressed out because I really wanted to preach. And I had been doing it for a while, but not consistently, you know. And I wanted to do it more. And I just felt like I was wasting my time in secular work. And then my mentor said, tell God you're going to do it. And just start calling. He's like, and, and if it's God's will, say, Lord, bless it. If it's not going to work out, shut it down. Well, I I saw, he told me that Main Street was looking for a congregation. I called uh, the number on there. I didn't know it was attached to Gist's phone, but it was. (laughs) And uh, he he asked, which one are you? Which Sam's boy are you? I said the third one, and he goes, I was hoping you'd be the oldest. And I was like, no, unfortunately not. He was like, well, we got a guy, but you can fill in. (laughs) And the the rest is history. But I just see God's providence in those things, right? That when we decide to do a work, We need to ask God, God, either bless it or shut it down because we can't care about the church more than God does. We don't care about the church more than Christ does. So we need to be on the lookout for that. Uh, Deacon, that's the last one mentioned in that passage. So that just means a servant, descriptive, a minister, a server, an attendant. Specifically, it's a selected group of men that meet specific qualifications for a specific work. And this is the important, well, let's look at this passage first. There's a lot of debate about Acts 6, whether they were the office of deacons and so forth. I I don't think that's the point. I take the Sid Latham approach. It's instructive. At the very least, we see servants, we see deacons doing the work and how they selected these men to do that work. So, I mean, that's the closest pattern I think we got right there. Acts 6, 2, and the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, this doesn't mean that neither of these things are important, right? But the apostles had a specific work that they needed to be tending to, and there was this other work that they didn't have the time for, right? They needed to be focused on this, and so they got some faithful men to accomplish this sensitive task because it seems like there was money involved, there was people involved, there was hurt feelings involved around this, and so it was imperative that they chose trustworthy, faithful men to accomplish the work. The office of deacon is not just something that, it's not just like a title, like, oh, I'm a deacon. You have deacons to do a work. It's tied to the work that is done. So we don't need deacons to just, you know, sit around or say, you know, we, we have multiple deacons. We want deacons to share in the work. And there's plenty of things. I mean, I just think of, you know, like Miss Donna has been controlling the sound for the longest time. That'd be awesome if we had a deacon kind of step in, take care of, of something like that. But we'll get into that more later. We're going to do a series. So this is just the, 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 the broad scope of things. So at the very least, we see an early prototype for the office of deacons. But specifically, the qualifications are found in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. And we'll go later in another sermon, we'll kind of go through these qualifications. But again, the role of a deacon is localized to the local body that chooses them for a specific work. 
All right, so here's the big question. Aren't all saints supposed to meet the qualifications of elders and deacons and evangelists? I mean, aren't we all supposed to be sober-minded and not a brawler and patient and able to teach? Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we are supposed to be doing those things. But this is the very important thing that we have to have in our heads when it comes to this. Goals and growth versus demonstrable accomplishments. There's a difference between these two things. So I'll show you an example. Philippians 125, for instance, it says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all, these saints, right, for your what? Progress and joy in the faith. That there's a progress, right? There's a growth progress going on here. And look at what Paul writes to young Timothy. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress, right? That Timothy wasn't qualified to be an elder or deacon, it seems like. Otherwise, I feel like Paul would have just told him, hey, you know, be an elder there or be a deacon there. But we have no indication that he was married or anything like this, uh, like that. But he was a young man and he had growth to do, right? He's supposed to practice them, grow in them just like the saints. Saints and the young evangelists are expected to make progress in contrast to the language used of elders and deacons. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 2. Therefore, an overseer must practice being above reproach? Or must show progress in being uh, uh, above reproach? He says, must be. It's an absolute statement. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And that Greek word literally means what must happen, what is absolutely necessary. So my point is the qualifications aren't up for bargain. We can't negotiate with this text because Paul doesn't negotiate with it, and he's absolute with it. So we need to be considerate, considerate that we don't loose on earth what hasn't been loosed in heaven, right? We don't have that authority. There's no growing into a qualification for elder or deacon. It's a necessity, must be. Whenever you apply for, the, for a job, what do they usually have on the application? Experience. They have, a, you must meet these requirements. And what happens the bigger responsibility that the job has? That list the qualifications gets bigger and bigger. Now, let me ask you a question. What if you needed brain surgery? You had something wrong with your brain and you needed a brain surgery. Well, most brain surgeons, they require a medical degree, scientific background, national medical license, the residency, all these things. All these things in place in order to be able to operate brain surgery, right? Now, what if you have a student who's learning about these things? Uh, They have a medical degree, but no residency, no hours log, nothing else. But he's a great guy. Are you going to let him do your (laughs) brain surgery? He's real nice, though. Man, he's just such a good dude, though. Y'all haven't met him. He's awesome. It doesn't matter, right? You're not going to risk your physical health at the expense of that, right? Just because they're a good person, awesome person, but doesn't mean they're going to make a great brain surgeon, right? When it comes to spiritual matters, it needs to be all the more important that we are consistent and clear and understand that these aren't up for negotiation. Does serving as an elder, deacon, evangelist make you any more holy or any more a better Christian? The answer is no. And I want you to think about it. Paul was not qualified to be an elder, but Peter was. The apostle Paul was qualified to be an elder, uh, was not qualified to be an elder, but Peter was. Think about that for a second. Does that mean Paul was less holy or not as, you know, not as good as Peter because he couldn't serve as an elder? Absolutely not. There's one body. There's one head. There's one body. So this morning, you may be wondering, well, what is my role? What am I supposed to be doing? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. So personally, this is entirely dependent upon you and your relationship with God. And I think this is the time that if you're considering any of these things that you need to be prayerfully and honestly open in your heart and asking for God's wisdom and what his will is for you. I mean that. Get down on your knees. Pray to God, Lord, what do you want me to do? And ask him. God's not going to steer you wrong. <laughs> All right? We, we, I, I, I worry sometimes and I realize that I'm taking some of these things on myself. And bottom line, it's, it's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's what God wants. That's what we proclaim. That's what we preach. That's what we live for. So 
make sure your prayer life is imitating this. The office of a deacon is not just like a stepping stone to the office of elder. It's a work. It's a specific work. The office of overseer is not a governor. They are all, all under the chief shepherd, right? That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 5. I think of it more like uh, referees, elders as referees, right? Because a referee can't change the rule of the game, right? They can't change how, you know, all the time rules and what's it down. They, they aren't, don't have the liberty to define those things because the laws have already been set. But they help with the enforcement and keeping on and making sure, making sure there's no violations of that law. And so, you know, elders, deacons, they all serve a very important role. But ultimately, all authority belongs to Christ. And none of us is greater or more holy than the other. We are all imperfect and broken people that have been made righteous solely by the blood of our king, of the head of Christ. And so my final question for you this morning is, are you a part of the body of Christ. I, I, I realize that most of the stuff, if you're not a Christian, may have been just super jargon and everything else, but here's what I want you to take away. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, as we close. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If you have been baptized into the body of Christ, you're part of the household of God. Can you imagine that? Being in the household of God, that's what we are. We're children of God. And so as we consider these things, we have to make sure that we're not, you know, making this straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel kind of a deal. We have to make sure that our hearts are right, that we have humble hearts, that we have loving hearts, that we have unifying hearts, because I realize there's a lot of complicated things within this, and there's a lot of things that not everyone agrees about, but we have to understand, Christians, it's okay to not be in perfect agreement about everything, right? As long as we're in agreement about Christ, we have to have that. And so what? This brother disagrees with you? I mean, there's a few of you I disagree with, and guess what? It's not a thing to me, (laughs) because we have to understand your position could be wrong. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and just studying this, I've already shifted my opinion from what I've held to for a long time. We have to be open to learning and open to unity. So just remember, this isn't about you. This isn't about me. This is about making sure that our worship and that we are representing the glory of Christ to the, Man, to the Mount Sterling community. We need to be creating this pocket of God's kingdom that looks enticing to those in Mount Sterling. We need to be inviting people. We need to be showing people Christ's generosity, his abundance, what it's like to be in the household of God, and we can't let all these things distract from that or cloud our hearts or let us you know, start getting into, because you'd be surprised in church. Well, I'd say you're probably not surprised if you're older. When things like this happen, there's a lot of times I've seen it, unfortunately, there's gossip, there's backbiting, there's animosity, there's rivalry, there's ego battles. And when we think about those things, I had a mentor tell me this, and we'll close with this, but he said, uh, he's an older guy, uh, Gary Fisher, he, he gave a really good talk about biblical leadership, and he says, you know, when you're looking for a biblical leader or elder, you're usually not looking for the guy that says, oh, me, me. He says, because, you know, whenever a toilet needs cleaned, you don't see those same people going, me, me. <laughs> it's something that's not enticing. So members, as you're putting your na- the names forward of who you like, look for the folks who... A, you'd want your kids to be like, and B, those who you've seen serve, that have a good reputation, that you haven't seen that kind of ego or those kind of things. You're looking for folks who are true, genuine servants that don't let their right hand know what their left hand is doing, right? That they keep that, you know, look out for servants because that's who we're looking for. Leaders are servants in the body of Christ. And if you're not part of the body, you're missing out on life, you're missing out on unity, you're missing out on all the blessings and ultimately eternal life as a resurrected being. That death doesn't hold a thing to us anymore, guys. Death has lost its sting because we're going to be resurrected. Let's go ahead and sing number C5 again.